Today we continue our study that we began last week called Now is the Time, Rebuilding with God's Help. It's a study of the book of Nehemiah. And last week we discovered that Nehemiah <coughs> demonstrated that he cared about the city of Jerusalem in four ways. He cared enough to ask about its broken condition. He cared enough to weep over its broken condition. He cared enough to, to fast and pray about his broken condition. And finally, he cared enough to volunteer to help rebuild it. Nehemiah, however, wasn't only a caring cupbearer, but as we're going to see this morning, he was also a charismatic leader. Now, when we think of a leader that has charisma, we think of it in terms of a person that has a magnetic charm or appeal that draws people to them. We uh, think of people like President Kennedy, President Clinton, President Bush 43, President Obama. We think of athletes, <coughs> former NBA superstar Magic Johnson, former NASCAR driver Carl Edwards. We think of Royals catcher Salvador Perez and St. Louis catcher Yadier Molina. All of these people have a magnetic charm that just draws people to them. When I call Nehemiah a charismatic leader, that is not the kind of charisma I'm talking about. Nehemiah very well might have had this kind of natural charisma. I don't know. What I do know is that Nehemiah had a supernatural kind of charisma. Our English word charisma comes from a Greek word that means favor freely given or divine grace. That was Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was a leader that was able to do what he did because of the favor of God. Nehemiah was a charismatic leader in the scriptural, biblical sense of the word. And we're going to see that clearly here in Nehemiah 2. So if you would, stand with me as we honor God's Word and read Nehemiah chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but we are going to talk about the whole chapter. So uh, don't worry, we're not going to read all 20 verses up front. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, What is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, where my fathers are buried, so that I can help rebuild it. And the king, with the queen, sit, queen sitting beside him, asked me, How long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may, I, may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple, for the city wall, for the residence I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of God was upon me, the king granted my request. Father, speak to us in Jesus' name. Martin Luther once said that faith is a living, <coughs> daring confidence in God's grace. <coughs> Nehemiah was a man that had such a faith. Nehemiah had a living, daring confidence in God's grace, and as a result, he experienced God's favor. There were three ways that Nehemiah demonstrated his faith in God. First, Nehemiah had faith to be patient. Look again with me at Nehemiah 2.1. It says, in the month of Nisan, 
In the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now to put this in context, and to understand just how significant this is, uh, we have to go all the way back to Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And I want you to look again at what it says. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Han and I, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. So in Nehemiah chapter 1, we discover that it was in the month of Kislev that Nehemiah asked about the condition of Jerusalem and discovers that the gates and the walls lie in ruins. Now, the month of Kislev, if you recall, I told you last week, the month of Kislev ran from mid-November through mid-December in our calendar. Okay, so fast forward then to Nehemiah 2, we discover it's now the month of Nisan, which is mid-March through mid-April. In other words, four months have passed. Now, is that a big deal? Well, it is when you consider what Nehemiah had prayed four months earlier. Look again at Nehemiah 1 verse 11. This was his prayer. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So Nehemiah, he's going to need some time off. He's cupbearer to the king, and so he's going to need some time off to go and lead the rebuilding of Jerusalem. So he prays. He asks God for favor with the king. One week goes by. Prayer's not answered. One month goes by. Prayer's not answered. Two months go by. Prayer's not answered. Three months go by. Prayer's not answered. It is now four months later, and Nehemiah's prayer still hasn't been answered by God. But Nehemiah doesn't give up. Nehemiah continues to pray and wait. Nehemiah had faith to be patient. He had daring confidence in God's grace. Now, have you ever known that God was calling you to lead something? Or called, called you to do something and you prayed that God would bring everything together to make it happen? And it didn't happen right away? What do we do in such times? We do what Nehemiah did. We wait patiently on God, believing that God's timing is never, ever off. Isaiah 55, 8 tells us that God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And you know what else is true? God's timing is not our timing. His timing is not our timing. Psalm 90, verse 4 says that a thousand years in God's sight is like a day that has just gone by. Think about that. Would you say that God's timing is not our timing when you, when you read that verse? A thousand years is just like a day gone by on his side. If we want to experience God's grace in those areas in which he's calling us to lead, then we must have faith to be patient. Now we live in a, we live in a culture that does, it's forgotten how to be patient. We live in a culture that's forgotten how to wait. I mean, if we want something, we don't have to wait to save up the money. We can just go what? Charge it. Some of you remember a time when, when there wasn't such a thing. You had to wait. And so we're, we're a culture. We don't know how to wait anymore, and we certainly don't know how to wait on God. We think that, that just because God reveals something to us and calls us to something, that it's going to happen just like that. Do you remember David? David, he's anointed as king of, 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 of Israel. And what happens? He goes right back into the sheep pasture. And it was years before he became the one who actually sat on the throne as king. He had to patiently wait on God. 
And God wants us to be people who patiently wait on Him. We pray and we wait. We pray and we wait. We pray and we wait. Melissa shared this story today with the youth. And honestly, I didn't know all the details of this until she I learned something new myself today. Jennifer actually hit a growth spur. Now that's a big deal. Our, our girls don't hit growth spurs very often. They're tiny. They've been tiny forever. So Jennifer actually hit a growth spurt in, 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 her, in her winter coat. Didn't fit. Well, we had been in a store. I don't know exactly which store it was. It was some type of department store. And Jennifer found this coat that she liked. But she was in between sizes. And they didn't have it. They didn't have it. They didn't have it in her size. She was disappointed. Have you ever wanted something and... And, 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 and you're disappointed that you can't have it? It's hard to hear. Sorry. You're going to have to wait. Well, we like Goodwill an awful lot because it saves us money. And uh, so a month is, I mean, I mean, it's been a month. And, 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 and Melissa, she's been praying to God that, that God would, would provide a, a coat for Jennifer because Jennifer needs a coat. And, and, and so she's been praying about it, talking with God about it. And every time that we've gone to Goodwill, they first thing, they go look at coats. There wouldn't be anything. And Melissa just kept praying, waiting on God. She had to have faith and patience. One day we go into Goodwill. Go to the coach. Jennifer goes, look, look, look. There's the coat that I wanted. <laughs> Melissa said, hold on, hold on. It may not be your size. It may not be your size. I go there and look, and sure enough, it's the coat that she wanted at the department store. And it's right there at Goodwill. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Faith to be patient. Does God care about coats? Absolutely. If you know anything about Goodwill, it's all people donating stuff. Is that a coincidence that the exact coat that she wanted in her size was found in Goodwill? Absolutely not. God answered the prayer of a praying mother because she waited patiently on God. And so we have to have the faith to be patient. God cares about us. God knows what he's doing. God knew what he was doing when they didn't have the coat in that department store. He knew that there would be a coat one day in Goodwill waiting for our daughter. He's a good, good father, but we have to wait patiently on him because his timing is not always our timing. We get in a hurry. Abraham is a classic example, right? He didn't have the faith to be patient. What happened? Kind of messed things up, didn't he? Are we still suffering the consequences of that decision all these years later? Absolutely. God wants us to be patient, to wait on Him. Faith that is patient will be faith that finds favor. Nehemiah had faith that was patient. And God's help, and God helped us to have faith that is patient. Second, Nehemiah had faith to petition. Nehemiah says in Verse 1, when wine was brought before King Artaxerxes, I took the wine and gave it to the king. Then he adds this, I had not been sad in his presence before. Now, in that day and time, kings were sheltered from anything that might bring them unhappiness. And so people always put on their best face in the presence of the king. It didn't matter. If they were in deep despair... They still put on their best face when they, when they found themselves in the presence of the king. Because if, if the king was in a bad mood, and your countenance made things worse for him, it could be, you'd yeah. be put to death. On this particular day, Nehemiah couldn't hide the sadness of his heart. He'd never been sad before in the presence of the king. No doubt he'd been sad before, but he'd always been able to put on that best face. But on this day, he could not hide the sadness of his heart. And as Nehemiah enters the presence of King Artaxerxes, the king notices. He notices Nehemiah's downcast face. Verse 2, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This could be nothing but sadness of heart. Verse 3, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. 
Why should my face not look so sad when the king, where the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? I don't know about you, but I, I, I think it's kind of cool. That King Artaxerxes was not so caught up in himself that he didn't notice that Nehemiah had a problem in his own life. I mean, here's a guy that had all kinds of things going on. He was a ruler of a kingdom, and yet he was not so caught up in himself that he didn't notice something was wrong with Nehemiah. He sees the despair that's written all over Nehemiah's face, and he, he's concerned about it. Today we have the assurance of knowing that the one who is king of kings, he not only sees the sorrow of our heart, but he feels the sorrow of our heart. And furthermore, we don't have to be afraid to come into his presence in our sorrow. The throne of grace is a place where we can cast all our cares knowing that the one who sits on that throne cares for us. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The word that's translated here as confidence is a word that means freedom in speaking. The grace of Jesus, it gives us the freedom to speak what is on our hearts to the one who holds our heart. We don't have to hold back. We don't have to be afraid. The throne of grace is a place where we can speak freely to the one that we know cares about us. He feels our sorrow, and he wants to give us the grace to meet that need. So after Nehemiah tells King Artaxerxes the reason for the sadness of his heart, I want you to notice what the king asked Nehemiah. Verse 4. The king said to me, what is it you want? <coughs> And then I prayed to the God of heaven. I want you to make note of that. Nehemiah was a man who had been praying for four months, right? When he had the opportunity to speak to the king, he, he again turns his face toward God and, and he prays once again before answering King Artaxerxes. He lived his life in the spirit of prayer. Michael. He said... If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so that I can rebuild it. Verse 6, and then the king said, with the queen, queen sitting beside him. Many believe it was Queen Esther that was sitting beside him. He says, how long will your journey take? When will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, so I said it. When the king asked Nehemiah what he wanted, Nehemiah had the faith to petition the king as to what he wanted. And the reason he knew what he wanted is because he had spent four months not only praying, but also planning. And as a result, when the king asked him what he wanted, Nehemiah not only knew what he wanted to do, but he also knew what it was going to take to do it. Nehemiah, he knew the time it was going to take and the material it was going to take to accomplish what he wanted to do back in Jerusalem. And if you were to read on in verses 7 and 8, you would discover that Nehemiah went on to ask the king for letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that he could have safe passage as he traveled from Susa to Judah. You would also discover that he, he asked for a letter to Asaph, key, keeper of the king's force, so that he could get the timber that he would need to, to rebuild the, the walls and the gates and the residence and, in which he would be living. Having prayed and planned, Nehemiah had the faith to petition. Verse 8, we read, And because the gracious hand of God was on me, the king ran in my request. If King Jesus were to ask you today, what is it you want? Would you have an answer? Remember that day that, that Jesus asked that, that man in need of healing? And it was obvious. This man had been in, in, in a condition his whole life, and, 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 and Jesus looks at the man and he goes, what do you want me to do for you? Sometimes Jesus will ask us, what do you want? 
That man knew what he wanted Jesus to do. Nehemiah knew what he wanted God to do. And so again, I ask you, if God were to ask you, King Jesus were to ask you, what is it you want, would you have an answer? Have you spent time praying and planning whereas you know what you need in order to lead the endeavor that he's called you to lead? Have you waited so patiently on God that you've heard his voice and you know his plan? When you know what you need because you prayed and you planned, it gives you the faith to petition the one who can meet the need. So if we want to experience God's grace in those areas in which he's calling us to lead, then we must have faith to petition. God's called us to lead our family, men. Have you spent time praying and planning? Do you know what the resources you need to lead your family? Listen, if, you, if, you've been, if you've been praying about it and you've been planning, listen, you have the faith to petition the one who can meet the needs in order to lead your family. So again, if we want to experience God's grace in those areas, we have to have faith to petition. Faith to petition will find faith. So Nehemiah, he had faith to petition. God help us to have faith to petition because we've not only we've not only been praying, but we've been planning. God give me a vision for something. Listen, when God gives a vision, we'll sit down and we'll seek his face and we'll plan. Listen, he'll, he'll show us the resources we need in order for that vision to become reality. So we can say, when he says to us, what do you, what do you want? So God, I'm glad you asked us. This is exactly what I need. This is exactly what I want you to do. So Nehemiah, he had the faith to be patient. He had the faith to petition. And finally, he had the faith to partner. King Artaxerxes, he grants Nehemiah's request. And Nehemiah, he sets, he sets out on this two-month journey from Susa to, to Judah. When Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem, he spends the first three days resting from the journey. You can't be an effective leader if you're worn out. And so you have to take time to, to care for yourself as a leader. But after resting for three days, Nehemiah, he goes out late at night, he does some examining of the walls. See, a leader has to see reality for themselves before they can effectively cast the vision and lead others. So after resting and, and examining, it was time to get to work. And so I want you to notice what Nehemiah does. Verses 17 and 18. Then I said to them, that is the Jews, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God upon me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start After resting and examining, Nehemiah turns his attention to partnering with others to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah knew he couldn't do it alone. He knew that it required the help of others, and, and that's what leadership is, is all about. It's about casting a vision and then calling others to help you carry out that vision. Nehemiah, he knew this was God's vision, and so he knew God was going to work in the hearts of people to do this good work. Nehemiah had faith to partner. You know, when Nehemiah cast this vision as being from God, the people knew it in their heart. And they said, let's do it. We, we, we can see that that, that this is God's vision. We can see that God's hand is in this. God had been working in their hearts, and they said, let's do it. They didn't say, it's always been this way, so it will always be this way. I mean, think about it. Here's a, here's, a, here's a group of people, all they've ever known, all they've ever known is Jerusalem lying in ruins. They could have looked at the situation, they could have said, it's always been this way, always going to be this way. They didn't say, 
who tried this before didn't work. Remember, Nehemiah was the last leader to go. There had been two other leaders previous to him who had gone to Jerusalem to try and rebuild the city. They could have said, we tried it before. But to their credit, when the leader cast the vision, they didn't say those kind of things. They simply said, God's in this. Let's do it. God's behind this vision, so we're behind this vision. Let me ask you today, do you have faith to partner? Whatever God's leading you to do, is it your belief that God is working in the hearts of others to partner with you to carry out that vision? Faith in a vision is seen in casting the vision to others. If you don't have faith in the vision, guess what? You'll never cast it. The proof that you have faith in a vision is that you cast the vision to others. Where there is no faith, there is no vision cast. God gave me the vision for Pray Over Springfield. Let me, let me tell you, the proof that I had faith in that vision, that it was from God, is that I cast it to other people. And God was working in the hearts of, of some people, and when I cast that vision to them, they, they embraced it because they knew it was God was behind it, and they said, let's do it, let's do it. And had I kept that vision to myself, guess what? What have I been saying about me? And have faith. When you have faith in the vision, you cast the vision. So if we want to experience God's grace in those areas in which he's calling us to lead, then we have to have faith in our We can't do it by ourselves. <clears throat> Moses, he couldn't do it by himself. So his, his father-in-law says, hey, hey, you're going to have to get some other people. The vision has to be larger than you, Moses. You're going you're gonna to have to get some other people involved. And so Moses is like, that's wisdom. That's, that's from God. I'm going to do that. And that's what he did. Nehemiah, he knew that one man could not go and, and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. But he knew many people working together with a unified vision that came from God that they could accomplish. So he cast the vision. He said, that's, that's good. I love it. That's great. Faith that partners will be faith that So let me just say this in closing. When we set out to be a charismatic leader, a leader that has daring confidence in God's grace, to do God's will, we will be met with opposition. Verse 19 says that when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, that they mocked and ridiculed us, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? When we set our hearts to do God's work, there will be enemies arise to mock us and ridicule us and attempt to stop us from doing God's work. When that happens, we need to continue to have daring confidence in God's grace and respond the way Nehemiah did in verse 20. You know what he said to him? He said that God of heaven will give us success. If you know that God's called you to do something, be prepared. People are going to rise up. Opposition is going to come. People are going to laugh at you, ridicule you, mock you. They're going to do everything they can to discourage you and say, you might as well just give up. They're tools of the enemy. Greatest tool, greatest tool the enemy has. You know what the greatest tool the enemy has? To keep God's people from doing what? God wants them to do, I'll tell you what it is, discouragement. Discouragement. When a leader becomes discouraged, the enemy won. And he'll use that over and over and over. He'll bring people 
to against a leader when they're casting a vision to say, ha, 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 ha. There's no way this is going to happen. They'll do everything they can to make sure that it doesn't happen. So just be prepared. If God's calling you to lead something, do something. Just be prepared. You're going to be met with all kinds of opposition. People who are going to try their best to get you to stop. And if you stop, the enemy wins. Don't ever quit running. Don't ever quit running. It's a race. And it's not just a sprint. It's a marathon. From the time that you accept Jesus to the time that you, you close your eyes in death. Listen, it's a marathon. Keep running. Keep running. Throw off everything that's hindering you from running the race that God's called you to run. See the vision. Keep running toward the one who gave you the vision. Listen, Jesus Christ, he's worthy of us running the race. <clears throat> I realize today some of you, you're here and you're discouraged. I've been where you are at. But I have to stop running. And I want to encourage you, don't stop from running the race. You're here today not by accident because God wants you to keep running. He wants you to hear today that He cares about you, that you can approach the throne of grace with confidence knowing that God's going to give you the grace to keep running the race. So don't give up. God's timing is perfect. I've had to remind myself many times in ministry, in due season, in due time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. We all want the harvest to happen right now, don't we? But I don't know any farmer that goes out, sows the seeds, goes back inside, and comes out the next night and says, oh, I can't believe they didn't come up. <laughs> they wait patiently on God to do something in that soil and in due time when you sow seed in the right kind of soil eventually you begin to see that harvest come up keep sowing because in due season you will reap Today, I'm so happy to be able to tell you God's got this. He's got it. So just keep looking at His face. Keep running. And when you get discouraged, He'll find just the right person, the right message, the right time. Strengthen your feeble legs, your feeble arms, so that you will be born. Again, if you're discouraged today, you're not here by accident. God brought you to this place. It's hard to get out of bed today, I'm sure, right? But He brought you here because He wants you to know He's not giving up on you. Don't give up on Him. Every bat, head bowed, every right nobody looking around.